Viewer discretion is advised. Mark Kilroy was born in Chicago on March 5th, 1968. But soon after his birth, his family relocated to Santa Fe, Texas. Okay. A small town outside of Houston. Mm. That's so funny that there's a Santa Fe, Texas, because there's it's everywhere. Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's well known for sure. But, but you know, there's also, a Springfield in every state in the I, contiguous US. But I'm saying it's funny because just a couple weeks ago on our road trip, my friend Shad said, My favorite city in Texas is Santa Fe. And we were all like, <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> he definitely meant Austin. Oh. But he said Santa Fe. But no, Shad, if you're listening, which you fucking better be. <laughs> you're a little bit validated here. <laughs> oh, my God. You're so scary. I love it. I okay, like to Santa Fe. my friends. <clears throat> <laughs> Mark, alongside his brother Keith, was raised by a devout, was raised to be a devout Catholic by his father, Jim, a chemical engineer, and his mother, Helen, a volunteer paramedic. Okay. Throughout his childhood, Mark was an excellent student who also excelled at sports and particularly basketball. He's a b-ball mm. boy. Okay. Basketball is where he met his three closest friends, Bill Huddleston, Bradley Moore, and Brent Martin. Bill, Brad, Bill Brent. Bradley, and Brent. Bill, Bill Brad, Brad, and Brent. <laughs> Bill, and, Brad, and Brent. And Bill, Mark. Brad, Brent, and Mark. <laughs> In the words of a 1989 Texas Monthly article, quote, all four boys, young men actually, were tall, athletic, and clean cut. None of them used drugs. All okay. were serious students. I know, right? Okay. okay. <laughs> all were serious students. They were the kind of boys you'd like your daughter to date and marry, and Santa Fe was the sort of place where you'd like your grandkids to grow up. Okay, projection, Texas Monthly. Right. That uh, was it. Was eighty nine. Also, Texas Monthly is a great publication. <laughs> Truth. After high school graduation, all four boys decided to stick close to home. Mark enrolled in Southwest Texas State University before transferring to Tar Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas, on a basketball scholarship. That could okay. also be Tarleton and Stephenville. I don't Got fucking it. know. However, nailing it. I'm nailing it. You However, <laughs> he decided eventually to give up his athletic ambitions and transferred again, this time to the University of Texas at Austin, a.k.a. Santa Fe, to okay. become a pre-med student. Throughout all of these changes, he remained close friends with Bill Brad and Brent. <laughs> In March of 1989, the four decided to take a spring break vacay to Mexico, as you do. Break. Spring break. They drove nine hours to the border town of Brownsville, Texas, where they had rented a hotel room and checked in around midnight. Mm. Nine hours. Mm -hmm. Texas That's... is too fucking big. Yeah, Texas is huge. It's kind of wild. Yeah. But like California would take fucking two days to drive all the way up the coast of California. Would it take two days? I mean, probably not like 48 hours, but that's probably closer to 15 to 20 hours of a drive. Yeah. Well, I could probably do it in 10, but, you know. <laughs> not all of us drive not the to brag, way but you do. I could probably bang it out in 10, but, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So they're in this hotel room in Texas. Mm -hmm. They then cross the bridge over the border into Matamoros, Mexico. Okay. Matamoros at the time was a massive spring break destination. An estimated uh -huh. 15,000 American tourists had descended on the city and they were being catered to with things like margarita drink specials and tan line contests. Okay. The things we were into in college. Seriously. That night, the four friends partied until around 2.30 a.m. and then returned to their hotel without incident. So this is all in the same night. Okay. The next so day, far, so good. It's kind of chill. <laughs> so far. Oh, God. The next day, they went to the beach during the day and planned to have a similar evening of partying with fellow spring breakers, tan lines, margarita specials, etc. Uh -huh. And at first, they did. But when it came time to head back home, things took a turn for the terrifying. Oh, no. The four young men were on their way back to the car when they stopped to pee. 
the next never, thing they never pee. <laughs> this never is, meet a man. Never never pee. meet a man and never pee. It's <laughs> my advice. The next thing they knew, Mark was nowhere to be found. Oh shit! After spending some time searching the streets for their friend, Bill, Brad, and Brent decided that he must have either met up with someone and gone to another bar, or just went back to the hotel without them. Right. So I don't know if they were just like peeing on the side of the road, like in a rural must, area, or they like they stopped at a like a gas oh, station or something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So uh, Bill, Brad, and Brent went back to the hotel and fell asleep. But when Mark was still not there when they woke up the next morning, their concern turned to panic. They called the police to report their friend missing and tried to piece together their fuzzy memories of when exactly they had last seen Mark. Because again. You're out partying. Right. You're drinking. Your timeline's going to get all foggy. Yeah, exactly. I get it. One of them remembered Mark stopping to talk to a woman from the tan line contest. Mm, hot. <laughs> As they made their way back to the car, while another remembered a Hispanic man with a scar on his face approaching Mark and saying something along the lines of, didn't I just see you somewhere or where did I last see you? Mm. Some sort of like inquisition. Mm-hmm. Neither recollection, neither recollection provided much to go on. And besides, police were not initially very concerned about Mark's disappearance, probably because, like, college boys, spring break, he probably just got yeah. drunk and went home with someone. And Right. And it's, you know, it's not in the age of cell phones. Right, so. right, right. How are you going to even really vet this? Yeah, so the cops were like, mm, okay. Mm. It probably also didn't help that half of this shit happened in Mexico and half of it happened in Texas. Yeah, that's tough. Mm -hmm. College students who had been reported missing from Matamoros in the past would often turn up within a day or two, usually with hangovers, but essentially unharmed. Yeah, it kind of sounds like a Tijuana adjacent situation. Absolutely. Like you can go right over the border, you get hammered. It's like a... It's and then like you a, can go home. Yeah, and then you just go home the next day. It's like a bachelor paradise. Yeah. Or even bachelor just like a, like a fucking Friday night thing for people who live close yep. to there. They, I'm yeah. sure the cops deal with that shit all the time. Mm-hmm. But as the days passed with no sign of Mark, it became, it became to seem more likely that something more sinister had occurred. Mm-hmm. His parents distributed 20,000 leaflets in the area and offered a $15,000 reward for any information leading to the recovery of their son. Oh, dear. It would not be discovered to what happened to Mark until a month after his disappearance, and the truth was far worse than uh, anything his loved ones could have possibly imagined in their worst nightmares. Oh, God. So I actually do know what happened to this guy, and it's really ugly, so buckle up. Oh. The discovery of Mark's whereabouts came about almost accidentally. On the afternoon of April, f uh, this says April 1st. <laughs> I think Nailed it's it. April 11th. <laughs> okay. Mexican police had set up a routine roadblock as part of their ongoing drug enforcement operations. When a car blew through the roadblock at a high speed, they chased it, followed it to a ranch property outside of uh, Matamoros called the Santa Elena. It's okay. the name of the property. Suspecting that the ranch was being used by a drug cartel, they decided to gather more information rather than going in immediately and risk getting, like, ambushed. Okay. They learned that the driver of the car who had blown through the roadblock was 20-year-old Serafin Hernandez Garcia, the nephew of Elio Hernandez Garcia, a local drug kingpin. Mm. So this was like a protected cartel person. Mm -hmm. Police raided the ranch on April 9th. Oh, okay. So that was probably April 1st then yeah. when he blew through. April April 1st. Okay. Got it. Police raided the ranch on April 9th and discovered 75 pounds of marijuana. That's a lot of marijuana. It's an awful lot of marijuana. Yeah. They arrested Sarah Finn, Elio, and three others, including the ranch's caretaker. As it was suspected that the drug cartel had been involved with Mark Kilroy's disappearance, the prisoners were questioned about Mark. Uh -huh. When shown Mark's photograph, the ranch's caretaker told police that he did indeed recognize him and that he had seen him on the ranch handcuffed in the back of an SUV. Uh-oh, that's not good. Not great. You don't want to be handcuffed by the, car by the cartel. You don't want to be handcuffed in the back of an SUV, period, full stop. You just <laughs> don't. 
You don't want to be handcuffed. Well, no. some people well, do. <laughs> that's <it> depends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Under interrogation. God, we're fucking losers. Side up. Right <laughs> <laughs> One of Corey's friends, like, moonlights as a bounty hunter, and he has a pair of real handcuffs. And he, yeah. And he put them on me, and I just pulled my wrist out because I have such baby hands. They're so teensy. And he was like, oh. Well, these do are I need useless. a child's handcuffs to deal with people like you? I was like, Probably. maybe. It didn't even hurt that bad. I just pulled them out. Oh, God. Anyway. Perks of having really th- Dainty Ugh. wrists. Tiny bird wrists. <laughs> I can't be contained. I can't. No one puts <laughs> tiny wrists in a corner. In a corner. <laughs> so fucking dumb. Okay. Under uh, interrogation, Serafin Hernandez Garcia and Elio Hernandez Garcia, so the, the, the son and the uncle, mm-hmm. admitted that they had kidnapped and ritually sacrificed Oof. Mark Kilroy. Oh, no. Seraphin told police he had been the one to bury Kilroy's body. Ooh. Police also learned during these interrogations that Kilroy had been had only been one of many people killed on the ranch in the preceding months, all supposedly on the orders of a man named Adolfo Constan- Constanzo, Ooh. who was a drug trafficker who had been operating a cult from the ranch property and instructing the Hernandez family and their associates To carry out human sacrifices in order to ensure success in their drug deals and protection from the police. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I've heard of this guy. I think we've covered him before in a live show. I don't know if we have. I feel like he's in, uh, there's a book we got, uh, I think from Spotify for one of our podcast buddies. Yes, I think that they talk about this guy Mm. in that book because I vaguely remember reading about this and i read it a while back so it's It's, possible that it's from in there it's really fucking ugly yeah it's gnarly Uh, i will get to some points that uh will jog your memory yeah 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 yeah. okay so Uh. costanzo along with his devoted uh disciple and sometimes second in command a 24 year old college student named sarah aldrete aldrete had managed to flee the ranch Mm. Police transported their prisoners back to the ranch and ordered them at gunpoint to dig up the bodies they had buried. Ooh. In total, there were 15 people buried in shallow graves on the property. Holy shit, that's a lot of people. They had either been burned, shot, <gasps> or hacked to death with a machete. Oh my God. This is a Kenyan case. Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, that is, that's a lot. Gets worse. Just good. from a cursory scan of the rest of these notes. Good, 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 Sar- good Sar- stuff. Yeah. Serafin Hernandez located Kilroy's grave by a piece of wire sticking out of the ground. <gasps> he explained to police that the other end of the wire had been had been attached to Kilroy's spinal column. Oh, so that could it could it would be easy to pull his vertebrae out of the ground. <gasps> After his body decomposed to make into a necklace. Oh. My God. Or earrings. (laughs) No, Lucy. (laughs) I just got done showing off my mandible earrings. I had to. (laughs) Holy shit. That's so fucking bad. When the police commander noticed that Kilroy's legs had been chopped off, he inquired uh, if this had also been for some ritualistic purpose. Seraphin stated that no, it had simply made him easier to bury. <gasps> oh, this makes me like want to borf. Mm-hmm. Even more gruesome discoveries followed. Take a deep breath. Great. Kilroy had had his heart torn out and his brains removed, the remains of which were later found boiled in a pot alongside a turtle uh, inside a shack on the property that was determined to have been the site of the murders and ensuing ceremonies. Uh-huh, uh-huh, this uh-huh. ritualistic pot, also known as a uh, ganga, ganga uh-huh. or blood cauldron in the religion. They definitely covered this in that cult book. Yeah. It's it's nuts. Mm-hmm. In the religion of Paulo Mayombe, which Adolfo Costanzo practiced a really perverted version of, mm-hmm. 
Uh, Casanzo, who was of Cuban descent and grew up in Miami, reported began reportedly began practicing Palo Mayombe as a teenager after his mother remarried a man who was a practitioner as well as a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. So this is when the two kind of married, like, you know, those two meshed. Yeah. Yeah. As a young man, Casanzo had moved to Mexico City where he set up a profitable business casting spells for good luck that involved mm-hmm. animal sacrifice. And he read people's, like, uh, fortunes. Uh, yeah. That I, that I know from the book. So, like, he made tons of money doing that. Mm-hmm. And then, like, also used these skills to manipulate people into doing what he said. He was such a creepy cult leader. So creepy. Yeah. It seems like he just practiced a lot of, I don't know if you'd really call it witchcraft, but a lot of, right. like, ritualistic ceremonies. Well, right. But he was, like, a fucking charlatan. Like, he knew he was using. Oh, of course. Yeah. He was using these traditions to manipulate people for his own personal gain. And he made a huge. He went way up in the ranks in the cartel. It was I mean, nuts. he's also a drug dealer. He's also yeah. a cold-blooded murderer. He's doing it for money because yes. he's making a fuck ton of money and selling drugs is of what he's doing. Yep, so, of yeah. course. Um, so many of his clients were reportedly wealthy drug dealers and corrupt politicians who enjoyed the violence of his displays. Mm-hmm. Casanzo became involved with drug trafficking himself and attracted loyal followers aligning himself with the Hernandez family at Santa Elena, so that's the property, and escalating um, from animal sacrifice to human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It would later be discovered that Costanzo had already started practicing human sacrifices before leaving Mexico City, but it had escaped notice because his victims were sex workers, homeless people, and low-level drug dealers. They just didn't notice and or care. Yep. Following the revelations, so fucking tragic. I know. Following the revelations of what had gone on at Santa at the Santa Elena Ranch, a massive manhunt was launched for Casanzo and his associates. Police finally closed in on him in a Mexico City apartment on May sixth. An intense gun battle ensued, mm-hmm. during which Casanzo ordered one of his followers, a man who went by El Duby, to shoot him before police could capture him. Mm-hmm. When police finally succeeded in storming the apartment, Casanza was dead. Five of his followers, including Sarah Aldrete, Aldrete, this was like Mm -hmm. his right-hand person, was arrested at the scene. Several other of his followers who were believed to have been involved in human sacrifices were arrested in Mexico City later that day. Mm -hmm. So they, they did a pretty good job at cutting the head off the snake in a pretty right. quick way but once yeah. once things started to get rolling mm-hmm. um and i mean it's un- it's it's unfortunate but also not surprising that it took the death of an american to put the pressure right. on the police enough to actually solve these crimes yep so and he'd been going back and forth between like mexico miami and texas for years yeah fucking dealing drugs and i mean it's like this guy did a lot of damage and you know that there are murders that are not attributed to him that were oh, him. I wouldn't be surprised at all. And people yeah. were doing all kinds of crazy shit for him. And he had like so many higher level, uh, like government officials in his pocket. It was so fucking nuts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He got away with literal murder for so long. Yeah. So the many people arrested in connection with Kilroy's death and the other murders carried out by Costanza's cult were given prison sentences ranging from 30 to 60 years. Mm-hmm. Which, like, why stop at 60? You, right. These are horrific. I know. These folks are definitely a danger to society. I don't know. I And I, I don't know how old they were when they went into prison, so. It might be long enough, and I don't know how the Mexican, pr- Mexican courts work, but right. it just, it, I don't know. Yeah. This is, this is, this is so, much, so much widespread violence. I know. And so much loss of life. I know. But it's like 60 years at the most, really? It just doesn't, yeah, it, it never feels like enough. Yeah. So the shack that had been the site of the human sacrifices was doused in gasoline and burned to the ground by police. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so thanks. <laughs> thanks, Kenya. Dina. That's, that's actually <laughs> Dina's fan pick. Oh, Holy classic. Shit. Classic. God damn and it. And if you haven't read that cult's book, Dina, read it because it's great. And it it's, is a great in-depth look at this case. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's really wild. And this guy was also bisexual, so he he would sleep with people, specifically men, like young men, to bring them into like his harem. Like it's even he just more had, manipulation. Yeah, he just had so much control. And he was a total sociopath. Like he did not feel connection to these people. Yeah. He was literally just doing it for his own gain. It was this guy was nuts. I'm gonna read go the back book. And it's read so that. good. Yeah, it's so yeah. good. Because like, well there's done. like multiple different cults in that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Each section is a different. Can't believe I just said cult. multiple different. You know what I mean? I know what you mean, girl. <laughs> I know what you mean. I don't love not, but like being redundant. <laughs> but like, could you find his arm? <laughs> if you like if looked you hard, look enough? hard enough <laughs> if you dig deep enough well I sure hope you liked that clip if you did like that clip make sure you are subscribing to our YouTube channel leaving us a nice review and joining us on Patreon for even more video content audio content salacious content all around come join us treat yourself <laughs>